we would be honored if you would join us. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Dungeon Crawlers, where we are here. We have an amazing guest that we are excited to talk to you about. And, well, I mean, let's just face it. This all happened because of Transformers. I'm just going to throw it out there. I know Alton is not a big fan of Gen 1 Transformers, but that's okay, because I am. And so is Krebs. And so is our guest, Ian J. J. Johnston. Uh, Yes, sir. Very creative guy. Amazing. I was just wandering down the aisle, and there he was, just busily drawing. Well, he wasn't drawing the transformer stuff but he was drawing batman the animated series mm. uh mm. panels which was fantastic uh, and amazing so good. um it was national batman day i had a i had to jump on it yes so i mean short of actually having the actual cartoon I mean, he had some really fantastic pieces and i will i will say i was impressed that he did a, a really awesome condiment king because you can't really do him well it, he's just one of those villains you can't take seriously and yes he really is a villain in batman so yep. uh you know thanks for being on the show yeah, uh, thanks for having me yeah, yeah. It's good to be here. And I know Krebs has some stuff he wants to talk about because oh my gosh, so much now. Yes, he, there's stuff. Um, there's some really cool stuff that we want to talk to you about. So I'm going to hand the reins to Krebs because otherwise he's going to be sitting here and he's probably going to fall off his chair because he's so antsy. Thank you so very much. That's extremely generous of you, Daniel. And may God have mercy on my soul. Yeah. Uh, so right. <laughs> actually, I'm super. Ian, it is it is, it is an amazing pleasure to speak with you. Uh, oh, I, thank you. I'm it's trying to like, pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, thank I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm trying to gather my thoughts on like exactly where I want to begin. And, uh, before the show started, we were, Oh, okay. Actually, hang on a second to give the audience context as to why you are so freaking awesome because you are freaking awesome. Let's start first with what is it that you do for a day job? What, what is your normal nine to five? My normal nine to five uh, uh yeah well aside from the brain constantly cranking nonstop, i uh, i work for a company called revity marketing agency um i kind of transposed from uh working in animation i was an animation director for years and uh, uh an old uh, colleague of mine reached out and said i should come check out this company and uh, i walked in and said hey um i can help with some animation i can help with some illustration and do you mind if i just take a seat and uh, whenever you guys need anything <laughs> I'll just um, take off running with it, and uh, it's been there. Uh, been there for four years since, <laughs> so it's, it's it's worked out. Nice, nice. So remedy marketing is that what you said? Uh, Revity, uh, like oh, revenue Revity. integrity. Rev- okay. okay, got you, got you. And yeah. so you're working at this marketing company where you do animation. Is that correct? Um, yeah, Revity Marketing uh, specializes in like SEO, CRM, uh, media, animation, creative for all content online. So we basically drive funnels to people's websites, get eyes on your product and your awareness out there and then help you grow your company and, and hopefully make better people in the process. Nice. Fantastic. Now uh, you, you work for a marketing company now, but the only reason you work for a marketing company now is because you have a very interesting past in terms of being a creative. Tell us about your creative past. Creative past. Well, let's see. Um, came out of the womb uh, holding an eraser. and That was uh, very creative. Your mom did not <laughs> expect that. No, neither was she. Um, we, <laughs> it got to the point where um, we would go to restaurants a lot. Uh, I don't know how far back you want to go, but this will just give you like the, the seed planted, right? So my parents, uh, you know, were all over the place. We were all over the place growing up. And I, so when you're all over the place, um, that could be cryptic for however you want to decipher it. But my parents split when I was about four. So I ended up eating at a lot of restaurants and uh, being traded back and forth between parents and uh, led to drawing on the back of placemats at village inns and various restaurants just to kind of keep me busy. And, um, and while my parents were figuring things out, I just focused on just creating on the backs of these placemats. The funny thing is that that carries through to today, you know, um, 40 years later, I'll go to restaurants and I'll still draw on the back of placemats and every once in a while they'll, they'll hang it on the wall um, or they'll give me a free dessert for it, which yeah, it takes 40 years to get there, kids. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> now, why are your drawings 
so valuable and so impressive. What's what's your artistic background? So, uh, yeah, just drawing since I was uh, born, I thought uh, Manifest Destiny, I thought I was meant to be an animator, an illustrator from the get go. And when I met people that didn't know who they wanted to be, uh, it was a shock of life. I I thought everybody kind of knew what they wanted to be. So it led into creatively exploring what does that mean? Um, I fell in love with Transformers, the movie. Mm-hmm. When it I came out, great uh, yeah. a hard sell for you there, Daniel. I know. <laughs> I know. I have so many copies of that movie. It's crazy. That was that was eighty five, eighty six, right yeah. through there. Probably eighty. Yeah, right through there. It was, yeah, it was, it was either eighty five or eighty six. Eighty six. And uh, you know, listen to Stan Bush and Vince DiCola wail in the background as uh, Peter Cullen cuts the track with John Machida and, and crew. And you got and, the touch. Oh, you know it. That's. <laughs> I'll tell you what. When I'm having a worst day ever, I plug that song in and I can tackle the planet. Um, that and dare. Those are my two. Oh, guys. That's it. Dare, dare to be, yeah. dare, dare to be stupid. Now, now, does he say Daniel or Dano? Talking about he's, when when Hot Rod's sitting by the fish bank and he goes oh, yeah. like, talk about being dull, Dano. Does he say Dano or Dan? He says Daniel, but Dano. Dano. Yeah, Dano. Dano. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but it was Transformers, and then a little animated film called The Snowman, which mm. had several directors that would air every Christmas on TV when I was growing up. And it had that uh, walking on the air song that da, 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 da. and then they would fly to the North pole and all the snowmen would dance. And then he'd come back home and then wake up the next morning. The snowman melted on his lawn. I don't know if you remember that piece. Um, beautiful little um, almost pastel kind of animated piece. And then Disney's Aladdin. Uh, Robin Williams galvanized the genie to the point where I, I knew for a fact I had to make my, my drawings do that. I had to, I had to breathe that life into the line I created. So that turned into becoming a character animator for video games that turned into uh, working for a great um, agency called eight fish at the time uh, it turned into starting my own company called too many legs animation, where um, did animations and visual effects and worked on the Aquabat super show. Yeah. That so turned, cool. That turned into, um, you know, mural painting for mavericks <laughs> which turned you know which in turn uh, rolled around into uh providing animation with a team of people for across the valley with a, a great a great body of talent and wonderful animators and artists i got to work with and and, and to this day i'm entirely grateful for having to had on my team and, and still to this day no i i feel very lucky to have known them and and then that turned into teaching art and animation and film and when I got into teaching film, it was film editing and student films and using the visual effects stuff that I'd done for the animation studio led into the marketing agency. So that's kind of a, an, a, an abridged timeline of kind of like where I've come from. Nice. Really quick. I got to make sure because there, there's going to be one thing that Krebs is it's sitting right at the edge of his brain. And I just got to tease him just a little bit more because, you know, it's, it's not every day that we get someone who I can look up on IMDb on the show, right? <laughs> um, and so for those of you who are at home right now, you know, pull it up on a second monitor. Or if you're on your phone, you know, keep us playing in the background, but you know, go, go take a look. But I, I notice in particular, and this is going to be a really bad tease for Krebs, mm-hmm. is that, you know, obviously Aquabat Super Show, I actually know that, which is interesting in its own way. Uh, <laughs> I am but far and away the youngest person on this show. But... Uh, I also noticed that there's a there's a theme of like horror and like more intense background psychological things and and I'm yes. just kind of curious like the guy who grows up drawing on the back of menus in restaurants all of a sudden is super deep into horror like what's that about? <laughs> um, yeah, so great question. Without going into therapy, let's because <laughs> I should be paying you guys. Um, <laughs> I have. Um, I guess what you say, like night terrors, and I've had them my whole life, um, and they're reciprocal. So what happens is that I'll have a night terror that will repeat, and especially when I was younger. But as I got older, they kind of diminished. Um, that kind of turned into a fascination of the macabre and led to um, pursuing it professionally, I guess you could say, to kind of conquer it. 
So every time I went to uh, deal with one of these night terrors, I, I would wake up in sweats and horrified. And every once in a while, you can ask my wife, I, I still wake up in the middle of the night, just drenched. But I find a way to turn that around into story, whereas I was kind of victimized by it when I was younger. And I don't know if that had to deal with my uh, things that happened during my upbringing or, or where they kind of manifested, but it did turn into a fascination. And now to create it is almost like to conquer it. Yeah. That's I mean, I, I totally, totally get that, you know, with, uh, with, with DCR, we kind of break the show down into three primary parts, right? We've got, we've got games, we've got films, we've got video games, but the, the big thing that connects them all is story. Yeah. And we talk a lot about how, you know, taking that time to process our own experiences and, and the real world around us through that lens uh, can be restorative in many ways, but it also becomes a powerful medium to connect with others. It's part of that human experience. Exactly. Absolutely. That's a great way of putting it. I agree. Yeah. We actually love the horror genre on this show and it's for exactly that reason. It's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a combination of roller coaster fear and confronting real fear. Uh, so thank you very much for shining some more light on actually like the healthier aspects of being in love with the horror genre. And yeah. it just so, so happens. No, yeah, exactly. That's where we got to talk about the Aquabat Super Show. Um, yes, which is terrifying to see oh, grown geez. men in full body spandex. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, see, this is this is how we this is how we tease and terrorize Krebs a little bit every <laughs> So we finally find something that he I mean, finally, that makes it sound a little melodramatic. There's something that he really excited to talk to you about. And I just gotta keep yes. dragging it out. I can't imagine what that would be. It's so <laughs> weird. It is no, so no. Weird. okay. I gotta be fair, Krebs. Go ahead. So I have to ask, what was your favorite breakfast cereal as a child? <laughs> no. Is this a Jiminy Glick? Is this what I, you're doing? I, yes, I, I'm glicking the crap out of it. No, um, okay, so uh so I do have a film background as well, although you have much more um, shall we say, like <laughs> you have much more professional experience with film than I do. Okay. Uh, you are, you are, have been in the industry longer. You have done more projects, that sort of thing where, where you actually get paid as a professional. And that is a super good feeling. It's a super cool thing, but about, oh, I don't know, six, seven years ago, there was this movie in production. Actually, I think the production of the movie goes further back than that, but, uh, there was a movie being made by a local director. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the director's name is Jonathan Martin. That's correct. And uh, I want to say he was working on it in tandem with his sister. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. She, she was part of the production. I don't exactly remember. I, I think she was writing on the script, but I, I don't remember 100%. It's, been years. it's been years. It's been years. I recall that she was attending school for film or something, and he was bringing her on board to give her that kind of professional uh, intro to the, the industry, so to speak. And what caught my eye for this film, two things. One, it was being made locally in Utah. For those who don't know, Utah is a, has a surprisingly enormous film community, both professional and, uh, and independent. And uh, anytime like something major happens locally in the film scene, I like to like be aware of it. And I found out about this local director, Jonathan Martin, making a film called Kiss the Devil in the Dark, which had two major, well, actually, I guess I had three major things going for me. One, it was local. Two, it is uh, part of the horror genre. And three, it heavily features a, a, a friend of mine who is an enormously famous actor, Doug Jones. Uh, Doug Jones and I are buddy buddy he and I did a film together that was not nearly as big or well known as almost everything else he's ever done uh, but he was in Kiss the Devil in the Dark and so immediately I wanted to go see this movie like um, as soon as I knew it existed I want to go see it and you got to be part of this production yes sir so tell us about your time uh, working on Kiss the Devil in the Dark okay well do you mind if I take two steps back to, to in order to fast forward so I'm at San Diego Comic-Con and I, uh, with the TML studios at the time, um, I had a partner, a great partner, um, uh, that the evolution of TML has evolved a couple of times. And, and my second partner that I had is a guy named Tim Roberry and we attended San Diego and I saw that Doug Jones was there 
So this is after we'd landed the contract and had worked on some of the shots already at this point. And I go walking up to Doug and I said, um, first I flattered him. And then I, I think I um, insulted him. <laughs> Good news. And it's actually very hard to insult Doug Jones, but go on. <laughs> You'll find out how in a second. Oh, so dear. I, I walked over to him and I was like, Doug Jones. I was like, Doug. And he was just sitting there just kind of casually up, up in the sales pavilion in the top part of the San Diego Comic-Con. And I go, oh, it happened to, you know, we're working on a project together, the kiss of the devil. And he goes, oh, yeah. And he stands up and he walks over to me and he places his hands directly on my face and then just mm-hmm. starts smearing my cheeks around mm-hmm. like I was made of Play-Doh. And he started pinching my lips together and feeling my nose, my skeletal structure, like just running his hands all over my face. I remember just going like, do not blink, like let this <laughs> moment seek in, you know, just just enjoy this moment. And uh, he, once, he, once he learned my skeletal structure, <laughs> I, we, we chatted for about, you know, a couple minutes about what he's been up to, the project, what he enjoyed about it, and, and what he was, you know, what he had on his plate come down the pipe. And um, I knew that he was the, the moon guy in the old McDonald's commercials. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. <laughs> Is he like so, Mac, Mac on the moon or something like that? The, the Mac Knight. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, something McKnight or something like that. So I chatted to him about that and it led into the conversation of his characters from Pan's Labyrinth or whatnot. And I said, so this is how you insult him. <laughs> okay, good. And I, and I looked at him and he's a very gaunt, tall figure. You know, he's, yes, he is. There, there's not a lot of meat on this man and, and, uh, but an absolute joy. And, and I said, um, so is that how you get all your monster films that you maintain that um, emaciation? Are you like, are you emaciated on purpose so that you can, Oh, <laughs> He looks me dead in the eye and he goes, I'm petite, dear boy. <laughs> petite. That's such a Doug thing to say. Uh, yeah. For those, for those who just need a quick reference, I mean, Ian hit on it a few times already. If you don't know who Doug Jones is, look him up on IMDb. He is the workingest man in Hollywood for sure. But uh, you have seen him a hundred times and maybe you haven't noticed. He was, uh, he was, two major characters in pan's labyrinth he was both the fawn pan uh and he was also the pale man the creature with the eyeballs in the palms of his hands he was in hellboy one and two as abe sapien he was also the angel of death in hellboy two he's he was uh, in fantastic four rise of the silver surfer where he was <laughs> the silver surfer uh he and the the one that most people recognize once you say it is he was Billy the Dead Boyfriend in Hocus Pocus. That is, that's that's him to a T right there, man. You nailed yeah. it. Yeah. And he's played a thousand other roles, and that's almost not an exaggeration. Like he is the Lon Chaney of our day, where he is the man of a thousand faces because he's always under makeup. Uh, and of course, in Kiss the Devil, I think they, I think doesn't he have scenes where he's in his human facade and then there are other scenes where he's like in the full like yes. demon regalia absolutely yeah there, there's a scene where he's, he's the butler right which was supposed to be the the unsupposed character i, I believe if, if i recall if my uh, spoilers recalls, spoilers yeah right there's a butler in the movie people don't let that ruin your night um <laughs> but uh yeah <laughs> and then uh dagon of course the the yes. main baddie Yes. Uh, so you get to work on this film and you're doing the visual effects on this film. Is that correct? Yep. I'm actually, uh, just to you know, be 100% fair to the team, I did have a couple of other artists that I directed over. Um, I took uh, the lead uh, visual effects projects. And then what happened is that over time, uh, due to just the natural ebbing of, of cash and funding and development, um, it, it kind of just landed on, on to, to my plate to kind of wrap up the last couple of shots. So I'd worked on every shot to some point or some degree, but I did have a couple other talented artists that worked under me at the time as well. I was running an animation studio uh, and I was trying to build a visual effects department with uh, Tim called TML VFX. And uh, we put a couple of uh, producers that were going to try to maintain it and sustain it. But it's just, it's just Utah, man. At, at that time, it's just, shaky ground and trying to find funding and the time to do everything that you need yeah. to, you know, and to survive. You, unless you negotiate your time and your money well, you could bury yourself working on one effect. You have to be very careful on navigating um, how much you can do versus how much time you've got to do it in order to survive. 
because you you could work on a film that you love all day and all night but if it pays you two thousand dollars over six months it doesn't matter how much you love that film you're homeless <laughs> that's right that's right that's so a good have, point yeah so you have to manifest you know an understanding of the business side but yeah working on kiss the devil it was Working on some of his shots was really were really fun. There's some really good. I got to do a lot of like blasts out of his hands, and he wrecks these magicians and just completely tears them apart. And um, the the lead um, protagonist in the show, I believe, if my if my memory recalls correctly, is Handsome Jack from the Borderlands games. Oh, um, and he was the lead actor in kiss the devil, the lead magician guy, I, my, his name escapes me. I'll have to look no, it up. So I, I well, sure. I thought handsome Jack, I, I could be wrong. I thought handsome Jack was played by Troy Baker. Troy Baker. I don't know. Let's see. We I'm looking be- it up right now. I, I have to know. Let's see, I'm pulling it up. Uh, uh, Damon Clark. Yeah. Damon Clark. Damon, Damon Clark. Clark. And he's handsome Jack. I thought it was, well, I know Troy in, Baker's in Borderlands, in Borderlands like 2. He was handsome Jack. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So I'm not wrong. I'm just wrong about which edition of, I guess. Yeah. Okay. The serialized na- nature of these things flip people yeah. in and out, but yeah, yeah. He was, he was handsome Jack in two, I guess. So that's amazing. But yeah. It was, it was, it, it was, yeah, it's crazy to see. And uh, there was um one of the, one of the lesser demons that Dagon has in it. I think her name is Archita. Uh, I think she was in game of Thrones like eventually. So this, this crew had just, you know, John had done a really good job and uh, put, putting together just a cast of just talent that were really ambitious and, yeah. um, and, and found this little niche here in Utah to, to pull this group together. So yeah, it was, it was a blast. So I, that makes me very happy because I, I love hearing like the, you know, the picture coming together, all, everyone's working toward the same goal, but the reason this movie sticks out in my brain for, so, for, you know, all so strongly is because I waited for it for years and I never got to see it. I still, to this day, have not seen this movie. It was, I was like on some email chain that was like, the movie's going to premiere on this date in this place. And I did that for like three years and I never saw the movie. What happened? Yeah. Fair, fair question. So I can only speak from what my perspective understood to happen. Okay. So there was a visual effects um, deadline that was leading up to Salt Lake Comic Con, now Fanix, right? Mm-hmm. And John wanted to debut this thing. So we were kind of ramping up initially to try to get all the visual effects done. We were cranking, 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 going through revisions, going back and forth, trying things out, testing things, R&D and things. We got to Fanix and John debuted what we had done at that point. Now, it was all a lot like um, Andre and, and Wally B., Right. When they went to say graph, it's like there were some shots that were complete. And there were some shots that were just kind of still rough, you know, visual effect here kind of thing, because the rendering or whatever time to get there. The process uh, uh, and the caliber of, of visual effects that needed to be done for this project um, were so intense that it just ate away the time just trying to compute the information. We didn't work in the most efficient manner because we'd only at that time, I'd only worked on maybe a couple other visual effects projects um, and ch- you know, cut a lot of our teeth on that, but we were still learning all the processes and all the ways to combine all these effects and after effects and premiere and, and get the effect that, that John wanted to have out of these things. That being said, from my perspective, we ran out of money and ran out of time. But John is incredibly ambitious. And so if I recall, I, he started outsourcing some of these effects to people in other outside of the U.S. Mm-hmm. And was trying to get shots helped out from those guys, you know, with uh, the budget that he was working with at that time. And it just kind of snowballed into oblivion. I, I remember that eventually... I saw a poster that looked amazing. I saw a couple other um, announcements of probably the same things that you were seeing. And then after the visual effects that I'd worked on and, and, and the team had worked on were done to a point that we could get them done with the time and money that we had, it was just into the ether. And, and I don't know where John took it from there. I ran into John years later at another convention. I think maybe Fanex. He had a booth. 
and he was very cordial and, and very professional, very nice. And we, we chatted and we talked about maybe getting a lunch or something and just kind of catching up. There was a little bit of trepidation there, I think, because we were so ambitious to do these visual effects and, and do this work for him that we were willing to sacrifice all our time to do it. But what happened is that we ran, we ran out of time. And I think that ultimately caused a little bit of a rub between us in our relationship, unfortunately. I don't know if John ever was able to secure more funding or other teams to finish the project. I don't know if he went to another team outside the U.S. after this. But after I saw him at that convention, that's really the last I heard of it. And so do you know if Kiss the Devil ever made it to the light of day? I have no idea to this day. It's that's okay though, because like it's when you undertake projects of that scope of that magnitude of that intensity, first of all, you're right. I mean, there's the pragmatic aspect of like, you have to manage your time. There has to be a certain amount of money involved. There has, you know, there are many cogs to make that clock work, but there is also no shortage of labor of love. Right. And so uh, I can only I can only fantasize, and I use that word correctly in this case. I can only fantasize about what it was like to work on that project. What was what was like one of the most important lessons, or the most important lesson that you learned from that experience? Oh boy, from that particular experience was that. If I can have a second to kind of, it's been like almost a decade, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's been. I mean, it's yeah. posted as 2016, but I swear he started work on it prior to that, like long before years, that. years before that, a couple of years before that. Yeah. I'd say the most valuable thing that I probably, because every you learn from everything, at least you hope you learn from everything. And if, when you look back on something and if you could succinctly itemize it down to one thing that you take with you, I would probably say that on that project, that ambition can supersede your current skill level, regardless of the talent and the lack of business, business management, I guess that was brought to the table. Let, let me see if I can find an easier way to say that. I was a better creative than I was a business manager. Mm. And, and I know that about myself, which is why I'm no longer running a company right now. I choose to work in, in creative strictly than run a, a business. And I think this was one of those projects where I learned that business in as particularly creative requires a whole other set of skills that I think people who are purely creative don't come equipped with. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking like, you know, creatives are right brained typically. Right. I think, or they left brain, right brain, right brain. I think they're, right they're half, they're half brained. I don't care which half, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, amen to that. But, but the side that's like analytics, that that's uh, uh, accommodations, but through, um, uh, accountability, um, breakdowns, um, charts, numerics, data, you know, um, tracking, follow through. Um, these are all lessons that I've learned within, you know, working at Revity, you know, um, support, emotional support, um, problem solving, asking the right questions, um, leadership. Um, these are all things that I didn't have at the time. And yet I was administering them like a monkey with a syringe. <laughs> so I felt like me trying to learn these things in the process is probably the biggest takeaway that that was like, not the best idea. It's not the most efficient way to work. It's not healthy for the relationships or the environment. Um, it, it's, the effects that were created, there's some really, really solid effects in there that really came through really nice and clean um, that I'm, I'm personally really happy and, and pleased about. But the overall project and the emotional state of how you feel when you leave it is really the lesson you learn. Um, and, and I'd say that that's pretty much where I'd leave it there is, is just that I, I think I was administering business work that I wasn't equipped to administer when I should have just stayed focusing creative. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, I want to fill in some of the some of like the historical um, spaces of of your past with regards to your career, how you got into it. We we have so many listeners who are creatives themselves, and they want to know how you know. Always the common question: How do you get started? And the reason that question comes up so much is because getting started is hard. Getting your foot in the door is hard, right? Just mm -hmm. the learning learning how to do stuff 
that you can do all day long, but how do you turn it into a career, which you successfully did? So how did you get started on your career? How did you get your foot in the door? Um, number one, hang in there. Anybody who's creative, don't give up. Like strap down, get excited, love what you do. Don't ever lose that passion or that need to create. You're going to have rough days. You're going to have days that feel like you just want to snap all your pencils in half and jump off a cliff. You're going to have days where it's just the, the rain falls in every spot and pot you put out on the lawn. It just feels like it, it's, it's kind of a, a deluge of experience and failure. But know that you know failure is where you succeed the most. The, the parental lesson that I, I came up with that I, I, I give to my kids regularly, more monkey, less syringe, is <laughs> where I, I say to them, um, if, you're, if it's easy, you're not learning. And let that sink, sink in for a second, right? If it's easy, you're not learning. That being said, when I wanted to get into the industry, I just was, number one, I, I wasn't put in a position where I worked for a video game company that was embezzling or taking our 401ks. <laughs> and um, I saw that on the accounts and I put in my two-week notice because, hello, <laughs> it's kind of illegal. Um <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows this, but yeah, you can't do that. It's like, sir, the police are here. They want to talk to you about the irregularities in the pension fund. IT crowd, IT crowd. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, find, find a window, right? Find a window. <laughs> Gentlemen's <laughs> jump. Gentlemen's <laughs> jump. And so I, uh, I was, my back was against the corner of the video game industry being a character animator. And it was like, um, now's the time. I just realized that if, if I didn't swim, I was going to sink. So I'd say the number one thing is don't be afraid to take initiative. The worst thing that can happen to you is them saying no. Um, but I went to a company and said, hey, I'll just rent this desk from you in your agency here for a dollar a month or $10 a month, whatever it takes for me to just sit here. Because I knew that being in that environment by in inceptualizing myself in that environment where there's animation and art and illustration and video and all that stuff being created... If they weren't going to pay me to be there, I was going to pay them to be there, but it was going to be on my terms. I was going to neg negotiate that term. And so I went to, um, he's, he's a great guy. His name's Ernie Harker. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind me dropping his name on, on, the, on the podcast, but um, I really enjoyed working for Ernie and he had a company called Eight Fish and he, him and his partner, uh, Tim, <laughs> coincidentally, um, were willing to take a chance on me and just say, yeah, we'll let him sit here and but I knew that there was work flowing through those doors that I wanted to be a part of. And if I was there, the, the path of least resistance, they weren't going to call an art artist outside a house. They weren't going to call an animator outside our house. They weren't going to call a media guy outside of house. They were going to, they're going to say, Hey, there's Ian sitting right here. Let's see what he can do. And I'd probably be able to pick up some of that work just by being present. And that technique has panned out for me a couple of times in my career. Um, I believe it's kind of similar to what I did when I went to uh, Revity. I said, hey, let me just sit here. If you guys got work for me, great. If you don't, I'll just be here working on my own things. And within a day, I, I had an animation job. Um, so if you, if you take that initiative and you can kind of scope your landscape out in the world you want to be in, find a way to be near it. Find a way to find out how they operate. Because these agencies in these places, they currently... Um, they, they don't run the way they think they, they don't run the way that you think they do. When you, when you watch an agency from the outside, it looks like all funny games and, 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 and animation that's just parties and like all the Pixar deleted scenes and everything that you saw from the video. You no, know, they're, you know, they're not like that very much. There's a lot of moving parts. And the more of those moving parts you can learn about, the more value you bring to the table when it comes to the work you create. But those aren't things that they teach you in school that, you know, you don't sit in a classroom next to a guy that, um, specializes in rigging and sit next to a guy that specializes in CRO and specialize next to a guy who specializes in account management, you know? So if you can, if you can find a way to be near these, these businesses that you want to work and just kind of siphon off like how they run without being intrusive or carried away by the cops, that's, that's you know, take that <laughs> initiative, you know, and, and it might surprise you what you learn that you can use to your advantage to get in the door, you know? Excellent yeah. advice.
Yeah, if, uh, you know, if, if experience is a currency with which we purchase advancement, right? Passion is definitely credit. It won't last you forever. You've got to make sure that you're adjacent in the right place in the right time and using that passion to learn the skills to get that experience. But I super, super resonate with everything you just said and, and good on you for <laughs> taking the beats and, and, and making it work. That's, that's a lot. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I've been hospitalized for my work and that's not, uh, that's not a metaphor. Like I, mm-hmm. I literally was working on something so intensely. I was working on a Batman commercial of all things. And, uh, and another deadline had to be brought up two weeks earlier to it. I finished the deadline and, and, uh, I woke up on the floor with a, a paramedic standing over me, shoving a needle in my arm. <laughs> and uh, I just forgot to eat, drink and, uh, and had a massive kidney stone. It was, Oh my and it caused, gosh. I blacked out. Yeah. It was just, yeah. So don't know your limits. <laughs> know, know that balance is important. <laughs> so uh, the, the next question that comes to mind is across your storied career, across your, the history of everything you've done, what is the visual effects or piece of media creation that you are most proud of? And like uh, something, of, does that have to be something like officially released or something that I, I mean, we worked on, but didn't get released or like, what are, you, what are your thoughts there? Anything, whatever you're most proud of. <sighs> Folks at home, I did not prepare him with questions before the show. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> That's actually how we always do it. We, ne- we never, we never tell our guests what we're going to ask them. We just ask them stuff. So yeah. congratulations. Well, you fell into my trap brilliantly. Keep going. Fair game. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm 40 now. When the hell did this happen? I've been holding a Wacom stick right? 25, 30 years now. And I'm going like, I, I, I still haven't finished reading Lord of the Rings, you know, I'm like, going, okay. Um, and that's not a joke either. It's still sitting by my bedside and I bought the damn book over 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> let's see, let's go, let's go with, um, I will probably say again, you know, if it's easy, you're not learning. The projects that were easy were fun. They were really enjoyable. The Aquabats was an easy project. That was a lot of fun um, to work on. You know, Kiss the Devil was a lot of fun. Um, that I worked as a lead visual effects director on a project called Tale of Redemption. And it was the project that gave me everything, but almost cost me everything. Um It was the project that taught me how to make better decisions and better deals when it comes to negotiating for visual effects on the front end. But I also learned a a ton of techniques when providing those animations. It was a job that started out with a handshake saying that they needed 18 visual effects. And two years later and over 200 visual effects later or, oh my or, or or 400 visual effects later so it was it was astronomical the number went through the roof after the initial 18 visual effects that i'd worked on and it turned into a maelstrom uh, of a project it was really difficult um business learning wise but because of that project i i have i've yet to have met a sharpening stone that tightened my blade that much it hurt a lot <laughs> <laughs> so and that's probably the one I value the most. Okay. And then finally, uh, when you take into account sort of like the modern progression of visual effects, um, and I can think of, of a few amazing examples in, in just the last two years, uh, what is something that's happening right now in the, v, in the VFX industry that just has your rockets firing? Like it's the coolest thing and you're super into it. Deep fakes, man. Have you guys been watching Book of Boba Oh Fett? my gosh, oh, yeah. deep fakes. Mm-hmm. You know, we're talking like Mark Hamill's back, right? And and the thing is, is that it's like, I love the fact that we started with Luke. He was like our guinea pig, right? He's like our deep fake guinea pig. That there, Now, granted, there's been lots of deep fakes prior to this. There's been online and people playing with it and figuring out the tech. But that book of Bubba Fett episode was the one that made me go, we are like 5% away from just <laughs> making another Buster Keaton film. We are like 5% oh. away from making oh. another Bruce Lee film. We are 5% away from making another, whatever you want, John Wayne, Marilyn Monroe, you know what I mean? Like Bo- Humphrey Bogart, you know, like let's like, and, and granted there's, there's so much potential in this, but it's also the scariest thing on the planet. It's like, yeah. 
you know, the, the, you know, the implications of, of, of this technology getting into the wrong hands can be diabolical. It's, it's like true. on the level of like Dr. Doom, you know, but on the same token, it's, it's a thrill, right? A minute. So I, yeah, that, that's kind of where my heart is right now. It's like, I, I can't believe that we're finally there. You know, we're like right on the precipice of recreating new content well, of, of stars gone by, you know? The really interesting thing about the deep fake stuff is now they're, they're doing it with audio too, uh, with audio books. Um, you know, one of my friends was telling me that you can go in, Audible is now doing audio books that are read by people that aren't around. Like you could have Orson Welles read your audio book now. And it sounds just like him. It's all AI driven voice yeah, acting. Right? AI driven, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a, a speculation. I, I have these things called Johnston predictions. And and what they are is that because I'm I I'm really in tune to kind of where things are and what things happen, I'll, something will hit me and I'll just call it. And every once in a while I'll, I'll nail it on the head. Um, like um, you know, a couple of examples was like I, I predicted Pirates of the Caribbean a couple of years before, you know, anybody saw Pirates really becoming huge. Um, you can ask my buddy Chad Harden about that one. He loves that story. Um, <laughs> then um, I also called um, zombies and called, um, you know, uh, Luke Skywalker being a cameo at the end of uh, the first uh, reinvention of the J.J. Abrams Star Wars. But the one that I'm, I'm calling now, oh, and I also called Harold Ramis as being a ghost in the Ghostbusters. Oh, I, was like, I was like, so good. Called Afterlife, guys. Like, <laughs> you got to have a Harold Ramis. You know what I mean? Like, how do you, <laughs> Come on. Um, but um, I think that in Top Gun, because of this AI technology that you're talking about, we're going to hear a synthesized AI Val Kilmer voice because <gasps> um, I don't know if you guys saw that documentary called Val. I haven't watched it yet, but I know what you're talking about. Destroyed, yeah. His son does the narration for it. And I thought it was him. And I was just like, no. He... And then you hear him talk in the documentary and like, oh, that man needs, he needs new windpipes that like, can we just like, 3d print him some windpipes yeah and um no it's just it's just not there his voice is gone but he's in top gun so I'm like how are you going to have the ice man talk i was like it's either going to be his son doing the dub or it's going to be this ai tech that that they introduce kind of at the end of that documentary which is really cool either way i'm super excited for that moment yeah i i, I feel it coming so an important question must be asked i i beg of you one more Johnston prediction, but it's a little more localized to this episode. Are you ready? Drop How on. do you think that you are going to do in our end of episode lightning round? <laughs> See, I feel like I am going to be minced meat and I look I'm, forward to it. I'm going to uh, make a prediction. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 a Daniel prediction. Yeah. Ooh. The final question, because I know what it is will turn out very favorably for Krebs. I was thinking the same thing. So I was thinking uh, the same thing. I'll, I'll take odds. I'll take odds. Okay. Okay. So with that, you know, we move to possibly the most important part, or at least the most exciting part for Krebs of, of every interview that we do. We're excited to have you here. And with that, Krebs, I need you to introduce the lightning round. Thank you very much. And Ian, once again, thank you very much for being here and giving us of your time. And for this le next segment, we just want a little more of that precious time as we enter the lightning round. The lightning round is very, very simple. I ask you a bunch of questions, very much at random, to be honest with you, with the exception of one which I always ask, at which point I just ask that you give me the first answer that pops up to the top of your head. Don't sweat it. Don't belabor it. Just give me the best answer, most honest answer as fast as you can. And it's how, okay. uh, how dirty can we get? <laughs> Because my mind's pretty messed up. It's a family show, but we all know where kids come from. No, uh, it's. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask about that later. <laughs> it works. It, okay. All right. So we open up with a few softball questions. Then we go from there. Ready? Fire away. Okay. Uh, Ian Johnston, uh, your middle initial is J. What does it stand for? Joseph. What's your favorite color? Uh, orange. What's your comfort food? Uh, it's pasta. Hugs or high fives? Hugs. And final, well, almost finally, almost finally. Uh, what is your stance on 1991's Batman Mask of the Phantasm? Love it. Endear it. Want to watch it. Can't wait to own the graphic novel adaptation and comic books that are out there floating in the world somewhere. I actually have the comic book of that. I will be over to steal it from you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and final question, final, final question. 
What is your stance on 1983's sci-fi fantasy film, Crawl? Love it. Endear it. It's a nostalgic <gasps> piece from my heart. And if I could have a glaive right now, I would drop 300 for it. No, no pennies pinched. There it is. Oh, Hold you. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew you were my kind of nerd. I knew it. I knew it right off the bat. <laughs> Man, the visual effects in that film are like really grossly distorted by today's. And I, and I don't mean like that by any stretch of the means. Like they're literally like just stretch the footage to make the monster look yeah. worse, don't they? I mean, it's just so cool how they did that. Oh, my gosh. I want to I would love to have a VFX conversation with you all about Kroll. I have a love affair with the movie Kroll. And I also am working behind the scenes on a docu-series that I want to make all about Kroll. I think it would be great to talk to you about VFX where that's concerned. Plus there is a maybe watch party, uh, possibly as early as this summer. And I think you should join us for that. Well, please send me an invite. Don't hesitate. Will do. But once again, I lose. And once again, Krebs walks away a winner. But with that, Dan, I think it's time for you to wrap us up. You know, I, I think we might have to do the, like some sort of outdoor film on this one. I think I, that's a great idea. I know. I know. But anyways, folks, with that said, uh, real quickly, if you, you know, keep an eye out for some of these amazing things that uh, Ian's done. Uh, if you're at FanX or one of these conventions, take a look, you know, keep an eye out for him. Try to hunt down his, his booth because like I said, the artwork that I came across and stumbled across is amazing. Um, it's excited. I'm excited to put it up on my wall. Um, I just got to find the right frame for it. Oh, I just wanted to say that I've got a podcast. If you don't mind me plugging real quick. Yeah, plug oh, yeah, I meant to ask weeks. you about that. I'm That's sorry. I was going to say. Uh, no, it's all right. It's all right. It's it. called Goat Comics, uh, G-O-A-T, Greatest of All Time Comics. And I'm going to be releasing a podcast here with a, a, an endeared friend of mine, Lynn Walker where we talk about the greatest comic characters and stories that you don't know exist that are nestled in your collections or possibly in stores in, in all the books that just have been printed over the years. So we, I look forward to releasing that and hope to um, have all you guys come on board and, and check it out. Let me know what you think. Yes, because we all love comics. We love superheroes. Otherwise those movies wouldn't be making the money, the amount of money they are. Uh, so check out, keep an eye out for, for the podcast. Uh, it's goat. What? Yeah. Goat comics. Goat comics. Very simple, easy. You don't need to try to figure out how to spell that. If you do, well, yeah, that's another, a whole nother subject. Anyways, uh, thanks for coming on the show. It's been fantastic. Uh, it's been great. Krebs wins another one in the lightning round because mm. he didn't have to convert. He didn't have to convert someone. The best. Uh, which is always well. Uh, so uh, Dungeon Crawlers, uh, tune in next week. Because uh, I believe we are going to be doing a review of the Batman. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have some thoughts, questions you want us to hit on while we're doing the review, send it our way. Uh, info at DungeonCrawlersRadio.com or even on our social media pages so that we can kind of discuss those points. And who knows, maybe some of us actually that weren't excited to see it maybe changed their minds. Yeah, Scott Silver. Just saying. So with that, we're out of here. Dungeon Crawlers, if anybody gives you 10,000 to 1 odds, take it. But more importantly, tell your story, whatever may come. And whether you're a Batman nerd or a Transformers Gen 1 nerd or any flavor of nerd, please always remember to be epic and don't suck. Remember, the Force will be with you always. 